Welcome to episode 25 of The Pulpiteer. I'm your host, Eric Hepburn, and I'm glad to have you join us for today's episode. Today's podcast is entitled Repair. This week is part live recording, and it's inspired by our Soul Matters theme for November, and of course, influenced by the election coming up this Tuesday. We'll begin with a reading delivered by Chuck Collins. I now invite you into a place of deeper stillness and reflection with a reading from Henri J.M. Nguyen. Nobody escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The question, the main question is not how can we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? I'll be honest with you, I'm at more of a loss than usual this morning. These are anxious times. And I wish I had a magic elixir to deliver from the pulpit today that would soothe your worries and anxieties. But I don't think I have that. But maybe together we can find it with each other this morning. I was listening this week to an interview with Bayo Okumalafe. And he was speaking about sanctuary the idea of sanctuary. And that made me think of this place. Because one of our aspirations is to be a sanctuary, a safe place that you can come into seeking shelter from the storm, a safe harbor. But good old Bio, he, of course, pushes us to go a little deeper in ways that are sometimes hard and challenging. One of the things that he spoke of, he said, in the ancient traditions of sanctuary, there was a commonality about the entrance to the sanctuary among indigenous peoples. That the sanctuary door almost always was configured or had an element of a monster on the sanctuary door. The head of a lion or a gorgon or a chimera, a frightening beast and visage was your entree into sanctuary. Let's unpack that a little bit. I think the more stereotypical versions of sanctuary is it's a place where you come to re-solidify, a place where you come to put yourself back together. Maybe you feel like you're coming apart, and so you seek sanctuary. But Bio says, and I tend to agree with him, that really what makes a true sanctuary is it's a place where you can go to keep coming apart. It's a a place of transfiguration, a place safe enough for you to finish the decomposition, the deconstruction of what you used to hold solid. You see, Rebirth is like metamorphosis in that way. You can't pause it, and you can't go back to the old form, but you need a cocoon, a sanctuary to be safe enough to complete 
the metamorphosis, to complete the change that is happening in you that doesn't feel safe to do out in the open. By listening to our wounds, we shape shift and we open ourselves up to change. Can we be a space safe enough for that? Because in these trying times, especially the next few weeks, we are going to be called to shape shift in one way or another, it seems to me. And we will need each other for that. And we will need the safety of a space where we don't have to hold it all together for each other. A safe spa a space safe enough to be messy. To cry with one another. Our culture isn't so good at teaching the art of grieving. So we will have to be like beginners at it. But if we do not do it, if we do not grieve that which deserves to be grieved, it will metastasize into fear and anger. Oh, no, that's not so bad. Everybody else does it, right? Everybody else is letting their fear they just metastasize all over the place. It's all fine. It is. Some of you will try to do it and fail. And this is not cause for shame. It is a normal human thing. But figuring out how to grieve allows you to become medicine for the people you love and care about. And I'm hoping that's starting to include everyone. Learning to grieve, to fight the metastasis that leads to feelings of overwhelm, of rage and anger and fear and anxiety. It's not an evil. It's a human condition thing. And if that, if you find yourself in that place where those are your overwhelming feelings, I'm not inviting you to beat yourself up about that. I'm inviting you in that moment to have some compassion for yourself in the same way that you need compassion from your loved ones and your friends and your community when you are in that space. But if you walk mindfully into this next week, saying, the grief is going to come, and the grief is earned and worthy of both my time and my attention, you might find on the other side of that gateway an increased capacity to hold space for others who need it. And I'm inviting you into that work. And it is work. It is emotional labor to do that. And we don't do it for ourselves. Or I should say, not only for ourselves. We do it so that we can be present to one another. There's another thing on my heart from my studies this week. It's a mixture of what Bio was talking about and the work of uh, Father Richard Rohr in his book, Falling Upward. And what Bio said that got me thinking about this was, he was talking about parenting. And he said that, uh, we sometime, sometimes tend to neglect that our children come into this world with wisdom already. 
do we stop long enough to hear their wisdom? We're so busy training them to be good citizens. Do we stop to hear what the spiral of life is trying to teach us through them? We've talked a lot about play as the most natural form of human learning. It's one of the things that my son teaches me every day to make some time for play and to see what happens. And in these moments, especially like right now, where everything feels so serious and dire, it may be that one of the main things we're missing is some space. Lay down that burden. It'll still be there when you come back. But find some time and space to connect with the people in your life who help you experience joyful playfulness. It's a spiritual practice. Make some time to spend time with your loved ones and your friends that makes you remember why you care about the burden. One of the most revolutionary things that's happening in social justice movements right now is there is a new strand of leaders and activists, Adrienne Marie Brown comes to mind, who are amazingly insightful on the following point. Taking the justice work too seriously and turning it into a slog just reproduces the old systems. You must find the joy in the work. You must. Not like you must, like you can't do it otherwise. You can still go out there and be helpful. But you will unintendedly recreate old systems of oppression if you can't find the liberatory joy that's driving you into the work in the first place. A wish and a hope and desire for all of us, for all of your siblings, to be free, to be free of oppression, to be free of exploitation, to be free to pursue their best life as you wish for yourself and for your family. But I got interested in this idea. I've got a circle transcribing birth to death. And Father Richard Rohr's book is about this inflection point at the top of the circle when we move through the moment of midlife. What does it mean for our energy in midlife to transition from the outward, the innovative, and to return home? To return home to deeper wisdom with all of the things that we learned in that journey. But not to confuse that with we started with zero wisdom and we hope to end with some. As many of you have probably discovered, some of us rediscover wisdom from our childhood. Things that we had set aside and left aside for too long. Those simple playground rules as the, as the memes on the internet will tell you about. Everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten. Everything I needed to know. But there is truly some beautiful and basic simplicity in those things. There is. I'm going to share a roomy poem with you. I'm going to read this poem, and we're going to take just two minutes afterwards, and we're just going to have a little quiet meditation. And I'm going to invite you to let whatever's coming up for you, whatever metastasized or unmetastasized thing is in your heart today, whether that's anxiety about the election or something closer to home for you, 
but I want you to try to unlearn the pushing it down and setting it aside for later. I want you through this poem to be invited to really feel what you're called to feel in this moment. The house overflows with drunkards, drunk on love. More come knocking. Crazed but still bound, they tore off their chains. You can't quiet this ruckus. The heavens are beating the drums in celebration. Ecstatic souls, hearts that serve the heart, broke free from their prisons and launched like birds. They shatter the jugs, no need for them. Their bodies are barrels, their blood is wine. Oh God, what wine did they drink? Oh God, what love did they taste? You can spend your time searching for the bad guys to blame. Or you can spend your time changing your own habits. The bio article led me, perhaps unsurprisingly, to some more work by Stephen Jenkinson that I hadn't heard before. So I think I want to end on this note, and I've spoken of it a little bit before, of this idea that we can't be reconciled if we weren't ever conciliated. There isn't an imagined past where identity, divisive identity politics didn't exist. There isn't a magical past where racial amity, en, 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 enmity didn't exist or patriarchal gender domination or things like that. I'm not saying there was never a moment when, or a culture where those things were more in balance than they are today. But I want us to let go of the idea of some idealized past we're trying to get back to. When, as Brene Brown would say, we are clearly in an FFT, a first frickin' time. We are, I, w I went to see at the Texas Book Festival a few years ago, I went to see Anand Girdardas, who wrote a couple really good books. And in his most recent book, he was on tour talking about it, and he said that um, what's interesting and unique about America, about the United States, and I have a hard time seeing this as an insider, but he said, I am from another culture, I've lived in a bunch of other cultures. Here at least there is a large percentage of the population really deeply trying to ask the question of how we can all live and be together and honor each other. In ways that I think it's easy as Americans to just assume that that's happening in those 
sometimes other places that seem to have their stuff together better than we do. They're not struggling to get health care to all their people. They're not dealing with the levels of poverty and incarceration that, to me, are hallmarks of the failure of our civilization. It's easy for me to see the faults and sometimes hard to see the heart and the beauty of what we are struggling toward. But as an outsider, or a more outsider than me, he said, when I, even when I go to Western Europe, there's no real motivation and drive to become a diverse, multicultural, accepting place. And so that is something special. So I wanted to hold that out there for a minute because any water that you swim in starts to become invisible to you after a while, whether that's good water or bad water, whether, whether it's the water of uh, heteropatriarchy or racism or the water of striving for a diverse, multicultural, egalitarian, inclusive society. Whatever water you swim in, you just start to ignore it, kind of like having a loving spouse. After a few decades, you forget to notice all the little things they do to make your life better. It takes a concerted act of will to circle back and re-notice those things and give them the appreciation that they deserve. You feel me? Can I get an amen? amen? All right, just making sure you're with me. So perhaps Stephen Jenkinson says, and now, sorry, let me frame this. Why am I, I'm going to talk about the word reconciliation, but I'm going to shift contexts. I think we could say, I'm going to argue for a different approach, but we could say that no matter what happens this coming week, there's some reconciliation that needs to happen between neighbors in this world that we live in, in this country that we inhabit. There's going to need to be some reconciliation. There's going to be some hard feelings, some hurt feelings, a lot of animosity. That seems generally unavoidable at this moment. But reconciliation might not be the right word because I don't think we've ever had true conciliation. It is an FFT. We've never had, we've never gotten to the point where we lived up to the promises in our own founding documents, if you want to put it that way. So what does conciliation mean? If we're not doing it again, what does it mean to do conciliation for the first time? Jenkinson says it's the capacity and willingness to sit down with someone who you acknowledge as your equal. Now, Bio frames himself as a post-colonialist, and you hear me talk frequently about how we have to disentangle the colonialist parts of our identity and our culture from the other parts if the other parts are to be preserved and to live up to the aspirations that they embody. And you've heard me say before that the heart of colonialist thinking and being sounds a lot like this. You have everything to learn from me, but I have nothing of great import to learn from you. It is the opposite of this sitting down with your equal thing, isn't it? It's the opposite of acknowledging that the person who you may be tempted to label as an enemy is just another you, just another equal human being with struggles, difficulties, traumas, both healed and unhealed, strivings, yearnings, an almost indubitable love for, them, for their families. Bio said this in one of the interviews. He said, 
The enemy of your ancestor was also your ancestor. The enemy of your ancestor was just another one of your ancestors. You see, identity is picking and choosing. The science of DNA is teaching us the depth of this siblinghood that we all share. The mystics have spoken about it for longer than we've known about DNA. But this universal siblinghood is something that I think Unitarian Universalism has been fumbling toward for quite a long time. but I think we have to stop talking about it. You've heard in anti-racist work the talk about decentering whiteness. And in anti-patriarchy work, the work of decentering masculinity. I think we also have to decenter Unitarian Universalism. It's a thing, not a better thing just like we're a people, not a better people. This superiorist judgment tendency that is a human thing. So in the cultural anthropology work, a word has come into vogue, and well, I don't know if it's in vogue yet, I'm gonna try and get it there. But it's called schismogenesis. And schismogenesis is the cultural tendency to wanna to distinguish your group from other groups. Now, what if schismogenesis isn't a fact of all human cultures? It's just, as Eckhart Tolle might say, a sign of spiritual immaturity, a sign of being driven by the collective ego, not the individual ego. Because, you see, schismogenesis loses its luster if it's not bolstered by a story that your way of doing stuff is better. And that is just an ego thing. It's the same kind of ego thing that we all struggle with. And maybe we struggle with it because we grew up in a world where they said, well, I'm pretty sure God is dead, and the universe is a cold, uncaring place, so you better take care of your own stuff. But I've been suggesting to you, based on my own personal experiences, that we are deeply cared for by something that wishes us well. Whether you want to call that the life force, which we still don't understand, or God, or Gaia. I don't care what you want to call it, but I'll let you in on a secret. I went on a vision quest because there was some healing I couldn't figure out how to do for myself. And I showed up in the middle of the night on God's back porch, and I knocked on the door, and I got the surgery I needed that I couldn't do for myself. And suddenly, the strongly held atheistic views of my youth couldn't be reconciled with that experience anymore. So I don't care what we call it, and I don't, want to, I don't think it's interesting to have theological arguments about it. but we are deeply cared for by each other and by more than that. There is a depth that we don't yet grok to this thing called life. And it is worth being in relationship with. It's what allows you to take hope that things might get better and turn it into faith that showing up for your part of it is enough and all you can do and you are enough.
and you are loved and held. Stephen Jenkinson also went to, took a trip to Israel. And he talked a little bit about what it means to show up as a stranger. What he said was this, the autopilot of self-defense is disabled by your willingness to show up as a stranger whose only motive is wanting to understand. The autopilot of self-defensiveness is disabled by our curiosity and our willingness to show up for one another with our curiosity out front. Amen. Until next time, thank you for joining us on The Pulpiteer. The Pulpiteer Podcast is a production of the San Gabriel Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Georgetown, Texas. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can make a donation at sangabrieluu.org slash give. The podcast is hosted by Spotify, and theme music is by John Faber. Our live recording tech crew is Frank Sanders, Rob Bertold, Keith Hutchinson, and Andrea McDaniel. Special thanks this week goes out to the folks at Soul Matters. The podcast is produced and performed by Eric Hepburn. See you next week.